You're right. I'm lost. Yep. You're lost, and I'm looking at a dead penguin. <laughs> The Pebble and the Penguin The first half of the 1990s was a peculiarly troubling time for animation icon Don Bluth. Disney was back in their place as the masters of animation with legendary hits such as The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King, yet Bluth's prime felt like it was behind him. After he and his team fully moved to Ireland, the movies his studio was producing at the time felt like they were trying to catch up to what Disney already achieved, and resulted in some of his weaker films like Rockadoodle, Thumbelina, and A Troll in Central Park. The last of these that his team developed was The Pebble and the Penguin, a movie where the production was so broken down due to rampant executive meddling that Don, along with his animation partner Gary Goldman, quit the movie during the middle of making it in favor of moving to Phoenix, Arizona, where they would partner with Fox and their new animation studio and work on Anastasia. In fact, because the production was such a mess, this is the only movie where he wanted to distance himself from the picture and take his name out of the credits, to which Goldman and producer John Pomeroy followed his lead. However, over time, some of these movies of that era did eventually find their audience, like how Thumbelina is now considered a cult favorite. But what about The Pebble and the Penguin? Is this another hidden gem that may be better than what we initially thought? Or should we throw our pebbles at it for causing trouble since its conception? Let's find out. Hey everyone, before we get started on this review, I'd like to mention that the movie that I'll be talking about, and to a certain extent, this review that you are watching now, would not be possible if it weren't for the actors and the writers who have played a key role in the making of this film. As you are probably aware, or during the time that this review was released, both actors and writers are on strike in order to protect their livelihoods, fighting for a more livable wage and job security from the threats of AI. As a professional actor myself, I stand in solidarity with the strikers and support their fight until they inevitably win. If you'd like to support the strike, then donate to the Entertainment Community Fund at entertainmentcommunity.org. Thank you all for your attention, and now, Enjoy the review. The Story This particular love story is inspired by the mating ritual of Adeli penguins, where the males find a smooth pebble to give to a female that they fancy, and if she accepts it, then they mate for life. I know that this may or may not be factually accurate and that there is a lot more to it than that little description, but I'm going to leave it at that because if you know anything about real Adeli penguins, they are a group of terrifying demons in tuxedos, and the less facts we know about them, the better. I could squawk and yell and make horrible noises. <laughs> However, in the case of the Pebble and the Penguin, that's honestly the only part that makes the story stand out. The rest is a very simple narrative where the good guy finds himself far away from home and must go back while teaming up with his newfound friend to reunite with his love and stop the bad guy. I think the weakest asset of the feature has to be the storytelling. I know it's not the team's fault, especially with all the executive meddling that corrupted the script, but the story is left very basic. This isn't just a generic love story for kids, it's only the foundation of a generic love story for kids with very few extra components to give itself its own identity. One part that hinders the experience is having a narrator who occasionally comes by with the voice of Shawnee Wallace. She was okay at the beginning to bringing us into the feature, but then she overstays her welcome when all she does is explain what the movie is already showing us, kind of like she's literally talking down to the audience. This, along with the movie's general tone, gives out the sense that the executives were aiming a little too low with their target audience, like they wanted to make this for preschoolers. Rocco was determined to teach Hubie that it wasn't enough simply being in love with Marina, the time would come when he would have to fight for her. Another issue with the story is that it doesn't give itself time to properly tell its own tale. Without the credits, this has a very short running time of under 68 minutes. And with that kind of time where it barely passes as a movie, it frequently rushes itself to jump from one plotline to the next. 
In a way, the reason why the story is so basic is because it doesn't have time to develop itself properly and needs to make room for the other elements like the musical numbers. It could try to add some extra layers like some side plots about Rocco wanting to learn to fly, or that Hubie's pebble somehow has magical powers like the Beast's mirror in Beauty and the Beast, but they end up having little significance or are completely forgotten. I want you to be my mate. Drake. Drake. I love Hubie. <laughs> Hubie. <laughs> and another problem that it causes is that it makes the ending sloppy. I will be entering spoilers here, so I'm warning you now to skip here in case you don't want to hear about it. I understand the argument of Rocco's flight dream does play a role in having him join Hubie on his adventure, but the payoff of it makes it ridiculous. Not only do they not explain what happened to Rocco after he seemed to have lost the fight against the killer whales and retrieved the pebble that sunk down to the bottom of the ocean, but how does he save Hubie and Marina? He finally learns to fly. But not like any bird, he suddenly becomes Superman! <laughs> However, I would not say that this whole thing is a complete failure. As bad as the story can be, there is some effort from the other elements like with the songs and even some of the animation to where In Return does help make the feature a bit more engaging to watch what else the movie has in store, but they can only do so much to compensate for what the narrative lacks. If there's a reason why The Pebble and the Penguin is not often considered to be part of Don Bluth's better films, one of them is certainly because of the story. The Animation No matter how bad the writing can be, it doesn't change the fact that this is still a Don Bluth film, even if he and some of his friends took their names out of the credits, and in return, the movie still has some stunning animation. However, I will say that it can happen when the looks can feel a bit off, and that is a case with the designs. Maybe this is just me, but I find the designs to be strange. It's like in that awkward middle of wanting to be anatomically correct and full-on anthropomorphic, resulting in a weird mixture that is hard to be convinced that they are supposed to be penguins. It really doesn't help either when they all prominently have hands that are left open when they waddle, and all have teeth that constantly show. I know that most cartoon birds can have teeth from time to time, but it's rare for any penguin in the pebble in the penguin to not show their teeth. Maybe this is a nitpick, but I find it weirdly funny how their teeth under their beaks are so commonly presented, like it thinks that's just how penguins are. Marina is mine. However, regardless of the designs and maybe the backgrounds are not so memorable, I will state that the character animation is still great. The flow of their movements is very smooth, the emotions are presented strongly, they move around and have some intricate camera angles where it feels like they are three-dimensional, even if this is a 2D film, and they have great choreography during the musical numbers. Speaking of which, the visuals can make those numbers the highlight of the picture, making them stand out moments with different use of lighting and dances to emphasize the mood of the moment not to mention the addition of going a little more abstract to reflect on the song's message. That's why one scene that stands out well for me was the opening with Now and Forever, where the penguins all sing and dance on the pages of the songbook of the music you're listening to. Then again, there is another thing that happens during the songs where the animation can be its biggest blunder. Keep in mind that the production was a mess, and it can show when the team had to cut corners just to finish the project. As a result... They make some of the unintentionally funniest moments of the film. It's true that it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's hard not to look away at the characters just frozen in time. I get that this is mainly set in Antarctica, but that doesn't mean that they have to act like they're in a block of ice. But you know one thing that surprised me the most about the film? 
For all of its faults and its juvenile tone, the action scenes are surprisingly good. Whenever Hubie and Rocco are in a life-threatening situation, the moments provide the right amount of intensity to get the viewer engaged, along with well displaying the danger and carry a fast pace to fit the mood. Sure, it can be dumb at times when Hubie puts his life on the line for that pebble, but that sense of risk there feels genuine. I know this isn't the best visuals in a Don Blue film, but this is still a Don Blue film, and when the animation gets it right, it does a great job to supply some enjoyability onto the film and make you smile just like what these penguins can weirdly do. The Characters As it is a movie all about love, it would be important that the audience loves the characters as much as the lovers do for each other. Considering that there wasn't much love in the making of the movie to begin with, it won't be easy for many to find love for the cast, especially with the fact that the film is so short and the script was heavily compromised it's noticeable when there can be side characters who seem like they would be Hubie's allies to help him find his girl, but they were only given one scene or two and their relevancy to the plot is thrown right out the window. Who are Hubie's bird friends? Or that tropical bug? Or those penguins in the good ship Misery? Don't worry about it, you'll forget they exist in the next scene. A love story. Oh, that's mushy stuff. Oh, Beanie. <laughs> Even when it comes to the main characters, as the writing supplies little substance, the characters have little to offer as well, working with the one generic trope that they carry. It's really up to the voice actors to make the most out of what they were given to bring them life. And I will say that there are some that do help make their respective role be more fun to watch. Starting this off, we got Hubie, the stuttering and shy protagonist who is in love with the girl of his dreams and is very passionate to make sure that he will be forever with her, no matter how far he can be from his home. As much as they want to portray Hubie as having a strong heart, there is an unlikable side to him where he could be manipulative, especially with Rocco. More than once, he has to trick him to make sure things go his way and that they stick to his plan. So there's kind of this underlying selfishness that the movie doesn't want to address about him. Oh, uh, well, if, if you're not brave enough... Hey, who says I'm not brave enough? Then I'll go. I'm brave enough. Speaking of which, there is Rocco, the tough and cranky penguin who teams up with Hubie to find his way back home. Honestly, I genuinely enjoyed Rocco, mainly because of the great performance by Jim Belushi. He delivers this no-nonsense, street-smarts attitude with a touch of sass that is a good contrast to Hubie's passion and optimism to be with his love. Well, I, I'm not a fighter. I'll teach you. I've never hit any. Look, the first thing you need to know about winning is how to bluff. Rocco, I can't. I... Do you love the girl? Of course I do. I... Then shut up. Then there is Marina, who really is just the love interest that wants to be with Hubie. Her role is to keep on delivering the message of love is not the pebble, it's the penguin, and that's it. But don't you know, it's not the pebble, it's the penguin. And then there's Drake, possibly the most stereotypical macho villain you'll ever find in a cartoon. First off, look how this man is built! That has got to be the biggest animated chest I've ever seen, regardless of gender. I did some measurements to make sure, and I can confirm that his body is approximately 50% titty. And considering that he has no regards to working out his legs, the dude is built like a light bulb. And not only is his personality just a Gaston clone, this movie wants to be clear that he is a villain, complete with dumb henchmen and a skull-shaped lair. I want to question why it's trying so hard to sell that he's evil, but then again, considering that there are some people who worship guys like Andrew Tate, maybe those clues that he's bad are necessary. Get the picture? However, there is one thing that does make him a good villain, and that is Tim Curry. And let's be honest, you can never go wrong with having Tim Curry play a bad guy, and Drake is no different to deliver a deliciously evil performance. So, nerd, I hear you want to be a big ladies' man. <laughs> Marina is mine. <laughs> With bad writing like this, it is expected that the characters get to lose points too, 
and this movie is no exception. However, I will give it that there are a few that did come out as enjoyable, so it is possible to find someone you like, but it really is a case of making the most with what the movie gives you. The Songs Yes, as an animated family film from the 1990s, it was kind of mandatory that this has to be a musical, especially if the team at Bluth Studio wanted to catch up with Disney's fame at the time. However, in the case of The Pebble and the Penguin, the songs are both bad and not bad at the same time. Sounds weird, I know, but allow me to explain. When listening to them with a critical ear, they do feel like they were crudely put together even if they got a prominent music star like Barry Manilow to create them. They sound like they were made not because of how being a musical would be the best way to tell the story, but rather it was a popular thing to do at the time, and it was more of a corporate demand in order to cash in on the trend set by Disney, as I said before. And the biggest reason that it gives me that sense is because of the lyrics, and this applies to all the songs. I won't say that they are terrible to the point of ruining the whole soundtrack, it's just that some of the words can seem questionable, like it feels more out of place and you wonder if that really was the best they could think of for the song. Let's just pretend I should have left you on that boat. We'll find our way through stormy weather. You want a friend, go find a snail. But while the songs may be mediocre at best from a critical standpoint, there is also something about them that honestly slaps. Sounds crazy, but they can unironically be some of the best parts of the film, with or without the animation to complement it. Even if the materials given were subpar, the cast and crew made the most out of them to feel like a grand spectacle. Kind of like they were made for Broadway more than for some non-Disney kids flick. Although I won't say all of them hold that pizzazz, but those that work can become the most memorable moments of the film. It starts off with Now and Forever, where the penguins put on a show to present how their mating ritual works. And maybe if the pebble is perfect, she'll tell me right there. Then it goes to Sometimes I Wonder, Hubie's love ballad where he ponders about life's mysteries and if he would be destined for love. Sometimes... I wonder if there'll ever be. Then it goes to the Good Ship Misery, a more comedic song about how being in the worst ship absolutely sucks. In fact, it could be so bad that even the animation can't function well. If you love the great indoors, welcome to the Good Ship Misery. Then there's Don't Make Me Laugh which is the typical villain song, but it's Tim Curry singing it, which automatically makes it awesome. Don't make me laugh. <laughs> Don't pull my leg. <laughs> and finally, there's Looks Like I Got Me a Friend, an upbeat and catchy duo number where Hubie realizes that Rocco cares about him. Hey, buddy, looks like we're two birds of a feather. There are a couple of short reprises as well, and have a more grandiose moment with those numbers, but the combination of this and the score by Mark Waters actually help enhance the picture a bit, where the music overall feels like it puts in more effort than it debatably has to for the kind of movie that this is. Again, not all the songs are hits and the lyrics feel like they are clumsily put together, but when they work, they can actually be a lot of fun and may end up giving the movie something of value that you may not expect. I think it's safe to say that this is not among Don Bluth's greatest achievements. And yet, I'd also say that he's done far worse than this film. The Pebble and the Penguin is a mixed bag of an animated feature where some things can be quite awful about it, but there are times when it does save itself to be somewhat enjoyable. The writing may be hopeless, where it delivers a generic and rushed story and a set of weak characters, along with the feature having some awkward lyrics to their songs and weird designs on the penguins, but there are some notably good things in here too, like the animation can be well done, some of the voice acting is enjoyable, and the music is unexpectedly memorable. I'm sure that not everyone would fall in love with this, but I can honestly see this movie having a fan base. 
That's why I recommend watching this film at least once to see if the good parts can make you appreciate it. If you like it, then that's a win for you. If not, well, it's better to try something than not. And if you enjoyed what you watched with this review, then how about giving this a like and subscribe to my channel? You could join me in finding more animated discoveries that may be worth your time. I won't say that this pebble was enough to make me love it, but for a movie that went through a disastrous production, it surprisingly came out okay. Hey guys, this is Animad, and one thing I will admit about The Pebble and the Penguin is that even though I don't think this is a great movie, there are some things that I really do enjoy when it comes to some of its stronger assets. Like the soundtrack, for example. I've already mentioned that the music is already really good, and it's one of the better things about the film, but I will confess that even to this day, I actually still listen to some of the songs. Like, I feel like they're kind of in that weird middle of being a guilty pleasure and being unironically awesome. And my personal favorites among them would have to be Now and Forever, both the original and the reprise, uh, Looks Like I Got Me a Friend, and Don't Make Me Laugh. Like, those are the ones that I sometimes like to go and listen to when I just want to go and listen to music. So yeah, overall though, again, not a great movie, definitely not one of Don Bluth's best, but there are some things that I definitely can appreciate. So with that said and done, it is now time that we will go and cap off this review and we shall now move on to a Patreon request. And this time around, it shall be from Tom Jackson. So I just want to go and say that if you would like to be like Tom and you want to go and support my work and get some amazing rewards, including but not limited to uh, seeing my videos before anyone else, then all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash animat. But at the same time, if you would like to suggest an animated film you would like me to review and that I would put onto the animation hat right over there, then all you have to do is just write me an email at animatsreviews at gmail.com. So now with that said, what is it that Tom Jackson suggests me to go and review? What is it that he wanted me to go and analyze? Well, interestingly enough, um, what he wants me to review is actually something from a TV show. And not just any TV show. This is often considered to be one of the biggest animated series of the 2010s. And I will confess, I haven't really watched any of the episodes of this show, but I am definitely aware of the cultural impact that it had, especially back then. Like, it was massively huge, and it was one of those animated shows that everybody was talking about. But the funny thing is, for the review that is coming up, I'm not necessarily going to be looking at the show. I'm, gonna do, I'm just going to go and skip ahead and check out the movie. All right, then. I kind of, sort of, maybe, you know. 